Hello, I'm Molly White. I'm a researcher, software engineer, and writer. I maintain the website Web3 is going just great, and I'm also a fellow at the Library Innovation Lab at Harvard University. What I'll be talking about today is my own personal perspective, and I should not be taken to be speaking for Harvard or the Library Innovation Lab. So we'll start with a glossary and a quick level set. Um, a lot of the terms that are going to be used throughout this presentation and the rest of the series can be fairly nebulous and people often use them to mean somewhat different things. So I think it's useful to make sure that we're all operating with a shared vocabulary. To begin, a blockchain is a type of distributed ledger that is immutable and often operates in an at least nominally decentralized fashion. So I'll go more into the decentralization topic in a little bit. But the important thing to remember is that it is a database where people can generally only add to the ledger. And once an entry has been added, it is very difficult, nearly impossible in most cases, to edit or remove that entry. A cryptocurrency is a digital asset whose ownership and transfers are recorded on blockchains. These are sometimes used to incentivize the maintenance of the network. So for example, people who operate Bitcoin miners or Ethereum validators are rewarded with Bitcoin and Ether respectively for doing so. But there are also other assets that are issued on existing chains that have nothing to do with maintaining the network and are used solely for speculation or for uh, various other projects. There are smart contracts, which refer to not contracts, but software programs that run on the blockchain. Um, if you are familiar with Excel, sometimes people will make the analogy that blockchain is sort of like an Excel spreadsheet and smart contracts are sort of like Excel macros, if that is a useful metaphor. Web3 refers to the incorporation of blockchains and crypto assets into aspects of your online life. Um, I would caveat this by saying that Web3 is very much a marketing term uh, and has become something that is used uh, primarily to drive hype and excitement about cryptocurrencies, um, but it is sometimes used to specifically refer to projects that are web-based and refer to using blockchains for online purposes. I will also add to something that we did not cover in the live session, but I think is important to distinguish, which is the difference between a public blockchain and a private or permissioned blockchain. So the majority of blockchains that we'll be talking about in this series and the majority of blockchains that are discussed just in general are public blockchains, which are networks that are open for anyone to read from. They, you know, anyone can see uh, the activity that is happening there. And anyone who is willing to pay a transaction fee can write to that blockchain. They can transact on that chain. These are very distinct from private or permissioned blockchains. In the case of permissioned blockchains, they are sometimes still available for anyone to read but only people with permission can write to the chain. And so there is a centralized entity that maintains that blockchain and decides who has access to write to the chain. In the case of private chains, those are fully private. So no one uh, but the permission entities can read or write to that chain. Um, you'll mostly hear about permissioned or private blockchains in very enterprise use cases. Um, so if you hear people talking about how blockchains are going to be used for supply chains or they're going to be used by traditional banks to process transactions, in almost all cases, they're going to be talking about private or permission blockchains, which are very, very different from public blockchains and are honestly not well described as blockchains at all. Um, they are just sort of a standard distributed ledger uh, that operates in a very traditional fashion. So... Again, today we will be mostly describing public blockchains. Non-fungible tokens or NFTs are unique crypto assets that are, again, unique. I realize that sentence is a little bit redundant, but the big distinction here is that unlike with, say, Bitcoin, where one specific Bitcoin token is not necessarily any different or more valuable than any other Bitcoin token, uh, NFTs are individually unique. So uh, one NFT, even though it may have a reference to the same exact image as another NFT, uh, is distinguishable and treated differently from that other asset. And as I just mentioned, these often hold references to additional data. So images are 
per- perhaps the most common. Uh, if you're familiar with, say, the Bored Apes, which is a very popular NFT project, those re- you know contain references to the ape illustrations. But you know it could be anything. It could be an image, a video, a URL, anything. Stablecoins are a cryptocurrency that is intended to maintain a peg to a specific reference asset. So for example, there are USD pegged stablecoins, there's ones that are pegged to the euro or the pound, Uh, there are even stablecoins that are pegged to other assets like commodities. Uh, And these maintain their peg in one of two major ways. So there are asset-backed stablecoins, which are at least claimed to be backed by a pool of assets that should be one-to-one with the number of tokens that are uh, in circulation. And so the idea is that you could take your one stablecoin token and exchange it for one US dollar or euro or whatever the pegged uh, asset is. Uh, You might be familiar with names like Tether or USDC, the uh, Circle-issued stablecoin. Those are both asset-backed stablecoins. There are also what's called a algorithmic stable coins, which maintain the peg basically through um, a series of algorithms that incentivize uh, economic activities that either causes the price to go up if it's too low or down if it is too high. These are somewhat notorious uh, because some of them have de-pegged in fairly dramatic and devastating ways. Uh, Most recently, perhaps, and most notably, would be the Terra Luna collapse of May 2022, which might ring a bell. Finally, we have decentralized finance, which is abbreviated to DeFi. This refers to blockchain-based financial services and financial instruments that don't necessarily rely on typical centralized financial intermediaries like banks or brokerages or things like that. Decentralized autonomous organizations are abbreviated to DAOs, and these refer to communities or organizations that have some sort of rules that are established in the blockchain software via smart contracts. Um, Typically, participants in these communities can uh, exercise voting power by using tokens to vote on community decisions, uh, and they've become somewhat popular in recent years. So to begin, we're going to go over some of the common themes that come up when talking about blockchains, cryptocurrencies, and Web3. We'll begin with talking about decentralization. So first, I want to make a distinction between the idea of distribution and the idea of decentralization. A distributed network is one in which the nodes of the network are distributed typically geographically. A decentralized network at least in the most common understanding, refers to nodes being controlled by different entities with no specific entity having control over the entire network. However, people who are talking about decentralized networks in the case of blockchains are often actually talking about distributed networks. But it's important to realize that a distributed network could be used, you know, an Amazon Web Services is a distributed network, for example, because they hold or they maintain data centers that are geographically distributed throughout the world with many, many different computers uh, operating within those systems. But no one really refers to that as a decentralized system because Amazon maintains the power there. With blockchains, people will often confuse the distribution for decentralization, even when the actual power is very centralized. So I think it's really important to emphasize the distinction between a distributed or decentralized network that is um, geographically distributed versus the decentralization of power, which is typically what people are thinking of when they hear about decentralization, but is not inherent to a blockchain. In practice, crypto tends to be highly centralized in in terms of power, uh, both from the blockchain level up to the projects that are built atop them and various stages along the way. So this is an estimation of hash rate distribution of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin hash rate is basically the amount of computing power that is being uh, poured into the network at any given time. Uh, This is a screenshot of it from the other day. in February 2022, Uh, and you can see that only a small number of mining pools actually are contributing a very large amount of the Bitcoin hash rate. So two mining pools control more than 51% of the network, and there are five major mining pools that, if they were to basically collaborate, could maintain control over the network as a whole. 
The same thing is true of Ethereum, which operates in a slightly different way since changing from a proof of work algorithm to a proof of stake algorithm. So now instead of mining like Bitcoin does, uh, Ethereum is maintained through staking where people stake various amounts of the Ethereum cryptocurrency, which gives them um, the ability to validate transactions on the chain. On the left, you can see a news article that was published fairly shortly after Ethereum moved to that model. Um, in which uh, Nansen and various other commentators expressed concerns that 64% of staked Ethereum was controlled by only five entities. I've included a screenshot on the right uh, to just illustrate that that is roughly the same today. So the numbers have changed a little bit, the percentages have changed a little bit, but the big players are still the same um, and the rough amounts of control are still the same. So this should be concerning to anyone who is worried about the centralization of the Ethereum chain. As you can see, there are some centralized entities like Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance on that list. Um, and even the nominally decentralized entities on that list, like Lido, which is a DAO, um, themselves are very centralized. And there are only a few entities that maintain a, a large amount of power within that DAO. And so again, Ethereum is much more centralized than it is broadly believed to be. As I mentioned before, there are points of centralization throughout the whole system. So not only are the blockchains fairly centralized, but many people and projects that interact with the blockchains are not doing so directly by operating a node, but they use APIs that are provided by a small handful of companies uh, that are very, very widely used. And so there's a level of trust that has to be placed in those centralized API maintainers. Beyond that, the projects themselves are often highly centralized. Uh, even ones that are nominally decentralized, but many don't even make the claim to be. So again, Coinbase, um, Binance, FTX, uh, OpenSea, those are all examples of companies that exist and control a very large amount of the cryptocurrency ecosystem, which are quite centralized in a very typical way, you know, that many companies are. Moving on, we'll talk about immutability. So it is accurate that once an entry is added to the blockchain, it is difficult to modify or delete it. Uh, but there is an asterisk after difficult because it is not impossible. And in fact, in that past, it has happened where um, blockchains have gone back and basically rewritten history to undo a transaction, something that would not be possible in a truly immutable system. The most notable example would probably be in 2016 when Ethereum was hacked. Um, there was what is basically known as the first DAO. It was called the DAO. And the members of that DAO had amassed a very large portion of Ethereum. Um, and an attacker was able to steal around a third of the Ethereum that they held, which at the time was worth around $50 million. Today, it would be worth around almost $6 billion. So again, this is not a small amount of currency that they were holding. Um, and because of the severity of the hack, the Ethereum blockchain and the people who basically exercised power over decision making in that chain decided to fork the chain and basically rewind to a state before the hack occurred and then just continue the chain from that point to effectively undo the hack. Um, this is why there are now today two blockchains. There is Ethereum and then Ethereum Classic because there were some a much smaller number of people who decided to keep going with the earlier chain. They saw the idea of forking as basically antithetical to crypto, which is supposed to be immutable for better or for worse. Um, on the topic of immutability, it might be a reasonable feature for a purely financial application where the only goal is to record where tokens are being sent. Because if you send somebody five tokens, there's no good reason to undo that. Um, you might have them send those five tokens back, but you don't erase the fact that it ever happened. Besides that, however, Immutability is not a great feature for many or even most Web3 projects that involve more than purely financial data, especially ones that involve user-generated content. So to speak a little bit more broadly, 
Anytime a platform enables user-generated content, they have to consider bad actors. And in a lot of these use cases, a few of which I have listed below, but there are absolutely more, um, people are starting to talk about using blockchains to actually store user-generated content. Some of the ones that are existing today either um, store the content in more traditional systems, in which case it is not uh, actually immutable, but there are some that use um, non-blockchain but decentralized storage systems like IPFS that have the same concerns. So even if it is not specifically a blockchain, the immutability concern is still there. Uh, and it's important to realize here that if someone were to upload content to that chain or to the, dis uh, the immutable file storage, it cannot be removed. Um, it can be hidden in some ways, but it is still accessible to anyone who has access to that file storage system. And, you know, in the cases of the blockchains and many of these decentralized file storage systems, that is anybody. So if we think of any of the many things that people could upload to a system like this, think of um, doxing, child pornography, revenge porn, uh, and even much less severe but similarly serious uh, issues around spam, copyright infringement, uh, harassment, things like that. Um, it is important for there to be some capacity for deleting that content. Um, merely hiding it from a platform built atop of it is really not sufficient. So um, that is something that really needs to be considered when we're talking about these Web3 projects. Anonymity is a commonly claimed feature of blockchains, and I think it is perhaps overstated. With anonymity on blockchains, you sort of get the worst of both worlds. It is very difficult for lay people to remain anonymous, whereas people with access to resources and who are more knowledgeable are more capable of remaining anonymous, in some cases in order to um, basically get away with criminal activity. So... For a lay person, it is relatively trivial. There's still some technological knowledge that's needed, but it is relatively trivial to create a new anonymous cryptocurrency wallet. It is, however, not trivial to fund that wallet, and without funds in the wallet, there is really no use for it. So it used to be that if you wanted to... Uh, you know, create a Bitcoin wallet, for example, and remain anonymous, you could just set up a computer of your own and begin mining Bitcoin. And you would end up with new shiny Bitcoins that had never uh, changed hands, that were not connected to your computer in any way, and that would allow you to transact anonymously uh, with new Bitcoin. However, these days, that is simply not feasible. The vast majority of Bitcoin mining happens in dedicated mining operations that have access to very cheap electricity and to very specialized hardware known as ASICs, um, which are basically expensive and very specialized Bitcoin miners. Similarly, you can take cash and exchange it for crypto. Um, so this is something that people commonly use today or do today using various apps like Coinbase, um, where you can sign up for an account. They ask you to complete a KYC process, know your customer or know your client, where you provide them with proof of identification, you know, a driver's license, a passport, something like that. And then at that point, you're able to connect your bank account uh, and you can transfer cash into your crypto uh, wallet, which you can then exchange for Bitcoin, Ethereum, any of a long list of cryptocurrencies. But as you can kind of imagine from what I just described, that's not anonymous. So even though I personally can't call up Coinbase and ask them who controls a specific wallet, uh, they are beholden to, you know, legal requests for data. And so it is possible to de-anonymize crypto wallets that have been funded in that way. It is, it is not at all anonymous. Um, there are some ways in which people will actually exchange physical cash for crypto. Uh, there are are some services where you can basically arrange to meet up with somebody in person and give them cash and they will give you cryptocurrency. Um, this obviously introduces some risks. It is a fairly dangerous thing to do. Um, and there is the risk that you end up with cryptocurrency that is dirty, basically, that has, you know, is the proceeds of a crime and you can be connected to it in some way. And finally, there is the idea that you could just transfer crypto from another wallet, but 
then you end up with sort of a transitory effect where that wallet then needs to be anonymous and the wallets that have funded that wallet need to be anonymous. So at some point, you can often trace crypto back to an identifiable individual. And even if you were somehow able to create and fund an anonymous crypto wallet, it is not trivial to keep that wallet anonymous because going forward, you have to make sure that you never transact with a wallet that has been tied to you uh, or tied to people that might be able to identify you. And once that tie is made, all of your previous transactions are de-anonymized. So I think the level of anonymity in the crypto world is vastly overstated. Furthermore, there are companies like Chainalysis, Nansen, Coinbase that provide very specialized cryptocurrency tracing software, typically to very well-funded entities like governments. Um, and this can make a lot of connections with blockchain data that are not necessarily obvious to you know a human eye, but uh, can be connected via the very sophisticated analytics that they are accomplishing. And so, um, you know, the advertised anonymity uh, really does not exist often in cases of a sufficiently motivated state actor or someone with access to these kinds of tools, especially if that state actor also has access to, say, subpoena power. Finally, transparency. So it is true that with blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many of the other major blockchains, uh, transactions are completely public. So this is a screenshot that I took from a blockchain explorer called Etherscan. This is, you know, anyone can pull this up on the web, type in a wallet address and see any transactions that a wallet has made. This is just a completely random one I picked out of nowhere. Um, However, there are some limits to this. So in this particular case, we can see that a wallet, these, these go in reverse chronological order. So in this case, a wallet was funded uh, with 10.44 Ether and then almost immediately sent that Ether to Binance. And Binance is a centralized exchange, which means that much of the transactions that they process actually happen off chain. So if you're using Binance and you decide you want to swap a cryptocurrency for some other token, you can do so and you will notice that it does not appear on chain anywhere. This is because Binance basically aggregates all of those transactions and occasionally um, basically synchronizes balances to the blockchain. But the actual transactions and the transfers that are happening within Binance are not publicly visible. And there are also other tools that are used to intentionally obfuscate people's actions on chain. So these are some examples down at the bottom. Some big names are Tornado Cash, Blender.io, Sinbad.io, and Renbridge. Um, and in the screenshot above that, you can see where a cryptocurrency wallet that has been tagged by the Etherscan, Etherscan blockchain explorer as Ronin Bridge Exploiter use Tornado Cash to launder around 600 Ether, which is a substantial amount of money. Um, if you're not familiar with Ronin Bridge, that refers to a blockchain bridge that was used by a cryptocurrency game called Axie Infinity, which was hacked in March of 2022 for around $625 million. And it was later connected to the actions of North Korean state-sponsored cybercrime groups who then used Tornado Cash to cover their tracks and um, basically transfer the money to various locations where they were able to cash out. Tornado Cash was sanctioned in August of 2022, partly because of their use by the DPRK, but also for their use by many other criminal entities. Um, but as you can see here, there, there doesn't appear to have been a major deterrent because they were able to simply switch to other services. So Tornado Cash is represented in orange. You can see it became very popular by the DPRK uh, in 2021 and then suddenly became less popular in Q4 of 2022 after the OFAC sanctions were applied. Um, and this is primarily because there was much less activity on Tornado Cash in general because U.S people and those who wanted to do business with them were no longer using it. And so it was less useful for the DPRK to launder money through 